Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Eisenberg, and I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Florida. We welcome you to our very first virtual Frontier Forum, hosted by the USF College of Arts and Sciences in partnership with the Phi Beta Kappa Association. In these unprecedented times, we're constantly looking for ways to continue to engage in important conversations and bring leading public intellectuals to our USF and Tampa Bay community. I want to first say thank you to our generous donors who support the Frontiers of Knowledge program. The continued success of this program that provides opportunities to bring thought leaders like Dr. Corey Brett Schneider to USF would not be possible without your generous support. Before we get started, and I know we could all use some good news, I want to mention some of the wonderful things that we've accomplished recently at USF. Just last month, it was announced that USF has once again earned the distinction of the fastest rising university in the United States, according to US News and World Report. Over the past 10 years, USF has ri risen 78 spots among all universities, from 181 to 103, 54 spots among public universities, more than any other university in the country. And this is also the second consecutive year USF is among the top 50 public universities in the nation. This upward trajectory in conjunction with our recent consolidation highlights the university's continued ability to both raise the bar academically and to make higher education more accessible to all students, regardless of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. It's also important that I take a moment to highlight one of our newest strategic initiatives, the funding of 23 research projects that will focus on systemic inequality, disparities, and other issues related to race and racism, an effort that began as a response to local and national protests calling for racial equality. These projects include 90 faculty members at the university across eight colleges on all three of our campuses, covering a range of topics. The college has many faculty members involved in interdisciplinary research that advances the way the world understands and responds to issues of race, racism, and inequality. This commitment to scholarship on race is reflective of the current political landscape in America. Many people are questioning how to best make progress and fight for justice in the midst of heightened racial tensions. It feels to me, and I know to many of you, that everyone has retreated to their ideological bubbles, dividing the country in ways that we haven't seen for a long time since the civil rights movement of the 1960s. As these passions have been expressed on the streets and in the digital world, it causes us to reflect more deeply on the nature and importance of free speech. Where do we draw the line between hate speech and free speech? Our distinguished speaker tonight will answer or attempt to answer that very question. Over the years, the College of Arts and Sciences has hosted more than 25 public intellectuals, including Jane Goodall, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Rory Kennedy, Roxane Gay, Matthew Desmond, and many more. And since its inception, this lecture series has worked to connect public intellectuals to our community in support of the liberal arts and sciences. This commitment continues even during a public health crisis. It's our mission to bring these important discussions to the forefront when we need them the most. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Corey Bretschneider, is professor of political science at Brown University, where he teaches constitutional law and politics, as well as visiting professor of law at Fordham Law School. He's also been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School and the University of Chicago Law School. His recent writings have appeared in the New York Times, Politico, and the Washington Post, including his newest book, The Oath and the Office, A Guide to the Constitution for Future Presidents. Tonight, he will explain his theory of value democracy and how the state can best engage in democratic persuasion, embracing free speech without emboldening hateful and discriminatory viewpoints. I know this analysis will be a welcome and timely discussion. So please give a warm USF Tampa Bay welcome to Dr. Corey Brett Schneider. Thank you. Um, uh, I wish, of course, I could be with you in person, but uh, wonderful to be with you all virtually. And thank you for that kind introduction. It's an honor to be uh, in the company of such great speakers. And uh, I've spent the day talking to students and classes and uh, about the issues that we're about to engage in. And it's really been a uh, fruitful, uh, engaging discussion. Uh, so I'll welcome your comments. Uh, I'm going to begin by laying out um, uh, two views that predominate throughout the world. One, the approach of the United States. One, the approach of pretty much every other uh, liberal democracy outside the United States. 
And then what I'm gonna do is suggest that both the dominant approaches fall short, and I'm gonna try to make the argument for a third approach uh, that as you just heard is uh, an, a vision of value democracy and an idea in particular of democratic persuasion within it. So let's get to it. Um, the first approach, the approach of the United States is really unique. Um, and I think that when it comes to understanding not just the doctrine, which we're gonna go in depth and talk about, but the philosophy of the United States approach to free speech, uh, it's sensible to think uh, sometimes political theorists in particular think about utopias or ideals, but it's helpful to think of the kind of fear of a society gone wrong. And I think our approach to free speech in the United States, and when I say ours, I mean the current jurisprudence in particular of the Supreme Court, uh, is uh, uh, a fear of what I call an invasive state, a state in which police cars are driving around outside our homes, uh, listening in to kind of imagine what is it that people are are, are saying inside to spy on conversations, looking uh, for wrong viewpoints. Uh, that might not just be an issue in which the state gets it wrong, as John Stuart Mill uh, famously said, but it would have a chilling effect on our freedom of conscience. And so in the United States, we have a vast jurisprudence when it comes to the protection of free speech. Uh, pretty much all opinions, or to use the court's term, all viewpoints are protected except for direct threats or um, speech directed at imminent violence. But the rest of the world has a very different approach, even though in the United States, uh, heinous things like Holocaust denial, membership in the Nazi party, those things are protected speech in the United States. In the rest of the world, they are criminalized. And the rest of the world, instead of worrying about an invasive state, worries about what I call a hateful society a society in which free speech enables uh, anti-democratic viewpoints to predominate such that they come to take over the society. And the worry about a hateful society is that ultimately it could lead, as Weimar Germany did lead, to a collapse of not just democratic values, but democratic institutions. And so the rest of the world criminalizes Holocaust denial in Germany, in particular, membership in the Nazi party. Uh, in France, they criminalized disparagement of Islam and the actress Bridget Bardot was prosecuted uh, for uh, under, under that um, criminal uh, statute. Um, uh, the rest of the world has an approach that uh, is commonly referred to as militant democracy. The idea is protect expression, yes, but when it comes to threats to democracy itself, Government has to defend itself from the kind of fascistic take takeover that happened in Weimar. Now, what I'm gonna offer is, and I'm gonna say more about these two approaches, but what I'm gonna offer is really a third approach, uh, which I call value democracy. And the approach is simple. It suggests that while it is right in a democracy to protect all viewpoints from criminalization, that if we are going to have such a robust protection of free speech, government ought to speak out in order to criticize some hateful viewpoints that do threaten the hateful society, that do threaten democracy. And government does that, and we can see how that can be done by distinguishing between government in its coercive capacities and government in its expressive capacities. Of course, when it comes to the criminal law, I'll say there are rights against government to say what we wish, even if our opinions are hateful or heinous. But at the same time, government, when it acts as a speaker, I'm gonna talk about license plate laws, uh, when it acts as an educator, I'm gonna talk about curricula in, in civics classes throughout the country, and when it acts as a funder of um, uh, uh, private organizations, should really use those funds, use that government speech to condemn hate speech. So my thesis tonight is that yes, hateful viewpoints, and I'm gonna specify what I mean by that, are protected from criminalization, but they should also be simultaneously condemned by government acting in its expressive capacities. I'm a political theorist, but I'm also a constitutional lawyer, and it makes sense to get clear on the meaning of hate speech and hateful viewpoints and the jurisprudence in the United States. And the most important case on this topic is a case called Virginia versus Black. And in Virginia versus Black, the court really defined our contemporary law of free speech and hate speech in particular by distinguishing between two sets of cases, two kinds of hate speech. In the first kind, 
uh, there was a fight earlier in the day, and uh, two individuals named Omara and Black burned a cross across the street from an African-American family. And what the court rightly, in my opinion, said about that cross burning is even though these two individuals claim they had a free speech right to do it, the court said, this is a hateful threat. It is the equivalent of saying, I am going to come attack you or even uh, harm you uh, later today. And it's not protected speech, that kind of hateful threat. So when it comes to what the court calls true threats, or I'm calling uh, uh, hateful threats, there is no protected speech. That is right. So that's not the domain that we're really going to focus on. But more controversially, what the court said in a second case, when the Ku Klux Klan uh, burnt a cross on a field uh, during a protest, during a rally, I should say, in which they uh, disparaged Jews, disparaged African Americans, uh, said the ideology of the Klan, which is really opposed to the idea of equality under law uh, in the manner of the Equal Protection Clause, the court said that kind of hateful viewpoint, that opinion, is protected. It wasn't a direct threat like the other case, and the court agreed to protect it. I think that that is right so far as it goes. But if we're going to have that kind of protection of a Klan rally like that, government needs to do more to send the message that the Klan is not protected for their reasons, but protected for reasons that they actually reject, protected for democratic reasons that are at odds with the Klan's ideology. That is a logic that's exposed in the case itself, in Justice O'Connor's opinion, in what I regard as the most important work in political theory, in democratic theory about free speech, Alexander Mickeljohn's free speech and its relation to self-government. Uh, and I'm going to say something about those two texts before going on to talk about what, what I think the right additional thing to do to, to clarify the meaning of hate speech in our democracy is, to clarify why, yes, it should be protected, but also condemned. What O'Connor said is that the Klan, she began with history, the Klan and its foundation in the 19th century is opposed to the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, an amendment and a clause not just a part of our Constitution, but that really rewrote the Constitution from one that was consistent with slavery, that allowed it, allowed the enslavement of individuals to one that outlawed not just that heinous practice, but that demanded equality under law, non-subordination. And the Klan is founded in opposition to that idea. And so what O'Connor really shows us is the Klan is not protected for their reasons. Their reasons are opposed to the Constitution. They, after all, wouldn't protect the free speech rights of African Americans, of Jews. Their ideology is at odds with the very reasons why we protect them. Uh, but that is sometimes lost, that contradiction between the protection of the Klan and the underlying reasons for their protection. It's brought out, I think, by the philosophy of Alexander Mickeljohn, who asked that we all imagine ourselves in a New England town meeting. And for those of you who don't know, I know that you're in Florida right now, but in, in the northern end of the country, the other end, uh, there's, uh, there's meetings take place where individuals make de decisions within direct democracy. Uh, so if the town wants to decide, are we going to build a bridge on the north side of town or the south side of town, everyone will opine, their opinions will be heard, and then there'll be a vote in the end. Mickeljohn says, imagine that the moderator of the meeting, who's just supposed to keep order and call on people, says, I'm going to disallow some viewpoints. I'm not going to let the people in favor of building the bridge on the north side of town speak, for instance. That kind of censorship, Mickeljohn says, wouldn't just be bad for speakers or limit expression. It would undermine the legitimacy of the meeting itself. The people in that meeting couldn't be said to be democratic citizens who had access not just to make arguments, but to hear all arguments so that they could then, in turn, as democratic citizens, make decisions. Now, what Mickeljohn turned that, that metaphor to do is to criticize the practice of prosecuting leftist speech, communist speech, anarchist speech, which was very common at the time that he's writing in the early 20th century. After all, Eugene Debs, the Bernie Sanders of his time, who runs as a socialist candidate, was in prison for his views. Uh, that's the treatment that, um, that dissenting leftist speech received at the time. And Michael John's point is, he was no leftist, but he said, uh, even as a moderate, I can see that banning those views undermines democracy, so it has to be protected. 
But at the same time, what I think has gotten lost sometimes in the court's jurisprudence is that somehow the protection of all viewpoints, the protection of the Klan has come with an understanding, Justice Jackson says this at one point, that no opinion is correct or that every opinion has an equal place in America. And that's actually just wrong. The Ku Klux Klan rejects the reasons of Micklejohn, the reasons of O'Connor and Virginia versus Black. They reject, after all, the very equal protection clause that's foundational to our democracy. They reject the modern understanding of the free speech clause as extending, regardless of race or religion, certainly. And so they are at odds with the very reasons why they are protected. So some regard that as a paradox. As you've heard me say, I don't. I think we can get out of it in the following way. We have to distinguish between when the government is acting as a coercer, as using its criminal law. In that instance, I agree with the approach of the United States, protect all viewpoints, and when it's sending its own messages. So take a recent case of the Supreme Court involving the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles. It's called Texas DMV versus Walker. And in that case, a group called the Confederate Sons wanted to place a specialty license plate on some cars in Texas, on their cars, that would use the Texas emblem and would also have the Confederate battle flag, what's sometimes called the Dixie flag, uh, together with it. And the Texas DMV said, no, it's one thing to have a bumper sticker or to have your own beliefs that you advertise in your home or uh, elsewhere on your car, but if you have the imprimatur, if you have the brand of the state of Texas, uh, you can't mix it with what we regard as a hateful image. And they rejected that specialty plate. The Supreme Court agreed with the Texas DMV in saying when government sends its own message, when it speaks, it doesn't have to be neutral between all views. It doesn't have to protect all views equally. And that's exactly the idea that I'm trying to get across, that you don't want to allow government to be complicit in hate speech. In fact, it has an obligation to condemn it, as the Texas DMV did in rejecting that plate. Uh, there are other examples, I think, easy examples, where you can see that distinction between government as a uh, user of criminal law and as an expressor of values. Uh, think of public holidays. We have, a, rightly, a national holiday celebrating Martin Luther King's efforts as a leader in the civil rights movement, working to correct the American apartheid segregation that uh, was defined by Plessy versus Ferguson, overturned in the Brown case that said separate is not equal, inherently unequal, overturned separate but equal, uh, and worked to spread that idea through legislation in the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. We celebrate that idea. We don't celebrate as an equal the idea of Bull Connor, the brutal Southern segregationist, we don't think that government can't take its own side. Robert Frost is supposed to have said a liberal is a person who can't take his own side in an argument. I haven't shown, seen evidence that he actually said it, but I'm certainly saying that liberal democracy needs to take its own side, and public holidays are an example of that. When we teach uh, African American history, Black History Month, and I think certainly there should be more than a month, and, and many places do have much more than a month, the curricula is not neutral. It takes the side of the civil rights movement in saying, rightly, as you heard in the introduction, uh, that this mass protest is a denial of the idea of separate but equal, a demand for equality under law, a rejection of white supremacy. Uh, we don't teach it as uh, e there were the Southern segregationists on the one hand and the civil rights movement on the other. We rightly teach it as a realization of this promise of equal protection of the law. Um, there are some cases that are very controversial, and my guess is that people will have a lot of questions about them, and I am going to talk as well about university speech, not just state speech. Uh, but I want to say something about some of the controversial cases as we get deeper into this, now that you've seen my view. When it comes to government funding, uh, 501c3 um, um, uh, grants, nonprofits, uh, tax deductible status. If I give a private donation to a nonprofit, I get a break on my taxes. It's a kind of indirect subsidy. During the Nixon administration, Bob Jones University was looked at by the IRS. Bob Jones University allowed African-American students into its school, but once there, if students uh, went on an interracial date, if they advocated the right of interracial marriage, a, a right affirmed in Loving versus Virginia by that time, uh, they were kicked out of the school. 
And what the Nixon IRS said is, uh, we're not gonna allow this. Uh, we're gonna allow it, I should say. We're not gonna punish it, but we're not gonna subsidize it. We're not gonna allow this university to be a 501c3, to be a nonprofit, to get this subsidy. And in denying that subsidy, uh, the Nixon administration was sued by Bob Jones University. The Supreme Court in the famous Bob Jones case rightly said it's one thing if Bob Jones would have been banned in their practices or banned in their viewpoint, but withdrawing a subsidy or withdrawing a grant is not the same as a ban. And government can take its own side when it uses subsidy. And I think that means funding anti-hate groups and withdrawing nonprofit status and other funding from hate groups. Many of you are familiar with Westboro Baptist Church, uh, a, a group that protests at military funerals to uh, protest what they claim are, is America's complicity in gay rights. And they protest these soldiers, not because they say they are gay, but they say these soldiers defended a nation that protected gay rights. And so that nation is being condemned by God through these uh, deaths. It's a very warped view. It's one that um, uh, um, the Supreme Court has protected though. In a case involving that church, uh, they said they do have a right, like all Americans, to protest not to target families, but if they're out on the road away from public view, uh, like that Virginia versus Black case, that's a First Amendment right to do so. But in another less known case, the Supreme Court, the, sorry, uh, a local court, looked at the question of their nonprofit status. They tried to deduct a truck. I think it's egregious that under our national 501c3 uh, law that currently uh, uh, the Westboro Baptist Church has a right to nonprofit status. I would withdraw it. Uh, so just to recap where we are before going on to university speech, I began by uh, distinguishing between the approach of Europe and the approach of the rest of the, uh, sorry, the approach of the United States and the approach of the rest of the world, including Europe. We protect all viewpoints except for threats uh, in the United States and, and speech directed at imminent or immediate violence. In the rest of the world, uh, they limit it or ban it. And my third way of doing it is to say, protect the speech from criminalization but also condemn it through the state's expressive capacities, public holidays, curricula, and even through its spending. What about universities and university speech? Many of you are familiar with the Chicago principles on free speech, a really important uh, defense of the idea that students are entitled to viewpoints of their own, that if you say something in a dorm or in a conversation at lunch, uh, and it's not a threat, it's not directed at imminent violence, you should be protected from being thrown out of that school, protected from punishment. I applaud the efforts of that committee. But one thing I think they were missing is uh, a reference to the earlier Chicago principles, which were known as the Calvin Report, written in 1967. And what the Calvin Report talked about is the idea that from time to time, the university's own values might find itself under assault. And it wasn't that the university was supposed to ban students that attacked its own values but that it could use its expressive capacities to respond. And that's really what I'm talking about. So what that means in the first instance is that if there's a, a th hateful threat on campus, if somebody uh, threatens another person in the way that Omar and Black did, I, I think of course those people should be punished, suspended, possibly expelled, depending on the situation. But if it's the expression of a hateful viewpoint, even if it's protected, University presidents, university administrators, I think have an obligation to speak out against it on behalf of the university. And we've seen that time and time again, and I applaud those efforts. Most famously, the president of Colombia, when the president of Iran was invited to campus, who famously, this president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, uh, denied the Holocaust. Uh, he was condemned by Lee Bollinger on behalf of the university for that false view. Another case involves, now we're getting into controversy, Christian Legal Society. Uh, Christian Legal Society is on many college campuses. Uh, they were at Hastings Law School. Uh, they allow um, uh, gay people in, gay students into the organization, but they disallowed uh, gay students from being officers, uh, treasurer, or vice president, or president of the Christian Legal Society on the grounds that uh, gay students would not be fitting Christian lawyers, that was the, the kind of language that they used, uh, that, 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 um, uh, um, that, that being gay, uh, or as they put it, and I don't agree with this way of putting it, that the quote unquote preference, uh, uh, which they confused with sexual orientation, 
uh, uh, is, is such that it's incompatible with their values. Now, what Hastings Law School did is they said, it's one thing if you want to meet on campus. It's one thing if you want to exist. But we're not going to subsidize that viewpoint. We're not going to pay for it. That case went to the Supreme Court. And the opinion, frankly, although I have a, a, um, a, 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 I'm very much in favor of Justice Ginsburg, I have a book out called The Decisions and Dissents of Justice Ginsburg. Uh, Ginsburg's opinion there, I think, is a little convoluted. She says that there's nothing more viewpoint neutral than tolerance, and that's what Hastings was doing. I would put it a different way. In withdrawing the funding from Christian Legal Society, what Hastings was doing was doing exactly what I'm saying. They were saying, your viewpoint is protected, you can be on campus, but we're not going to support you if you deny the equal status of gay students uh, at our law school. Uh, so there's a parallel between the argument that I've given for state speech and the, the way forward, I think, for these difficult issues of speech on campus. Uh, I'll talk a little bit, not about university education, but about high school education. Uh, there's a case in Canada uh, called Keystra. Keystra is a teacher uh, in Canada in a public school uh, and denies the Holocaust in front of his uh, uh, students and makes a number of anti-Semitic statements. Keystra is imprisoned under Canada's hate speech code. How would value democracy handle that? Uh, in the United States, rightly, I think he couldn't be imprisoned, uh, even for those heinous views, but he certainly should have been fired. And I think that when we see the role of government, uh, and this isn't true of university education, but certainly in the lower grades, in trying to uh, spread the ideas, the ideas of equality under law, we have to have public employees that are acting consistent with that idea. And certainly when it comes to police officers who are members of the Ku Klux Klan or hate groups, there is not a by the way connection to the violence that we're seeing from police officers. If those officers uh, have those views, uh, their bias is likely going to play out and often has played out in the way that people are treated on the street. And so I am for firing police officers as well. Uh, who are members of the Klan or members of hate groups or express those sentiments even online. Uh, you have a right to those views. You can't be prosecuted for them, on my view, unlike Canada, unlike the rest of the world. But when government employs people, it expects them to pursue certain duties. It expects certain things from them. So to sum up again, we've got two approaches, the approach of the rest of the world, the approach of the United States. And I've offered this third way, and the third way forward is to protect but condemn, to protect all viewpoints from criminalization, but to allow when the government uses its own expression to criticize and to condemn hateful viewpoints. And most controversially, that involves the withdrawal of funds. Yes, the firing of public employees who um, uh, reveal hateful viewpoints online or otherwise. Uh, certainly that Keystra case is a good example. Uh, and it's certainly on college campuses calls for university administrators to criticize hate speech at the same time that it does have a, a protection from punishment um, in some, some instances, uh, not, not in instances when it's hateful. We're living in a, a really, I mean, egregious time in America watching um, what can only be called murder in the Floyd case, uh, cases around the country. Uh, uh, these are not disconnected issues. I wrote uh, my book about hate speech, When the State Speaks, What Should It Say?, about a decade ago. One reply to it was, there is no problem of explicit racism in the United States anymore, and so you're responding to a non-problem, Brett Schneider. Uh, it's very hard to see that at this moment. Uh, we're also seeing, I think, an example of the, the kind of damage that so-called neutrality can do, the way that government officials who claim to be neutral might be complicit in hate speech. And I'm thinking, of course, uh, if there's one paradigm of the view that I'm saying, it's the wrongness of Donald Trump when he claimed that in Charlottesville there were good people on both sides. Uh, uh, no, that kind of two sides approach to the problem of hate speech gets it exactly wrong. We protect these views not for the views of those who are marching with tiki torches, uh, not those who are saying uh, Jews will not replace us, uh, but for democratic reasons. And that means that even if views like that are gonna be protected, that government officials, certainly a president whose job uh, is as representative of all of the American people is to condemn hate speech. Uh, that was a failing of duty. Um, in the 19th century, uh, uh, Andrew Johnson was impeached for his intemperate speech. He talked about 
uh, the need for violence against uh, senators and congressmen who had defended civil rights laws. Uh, and um, that, I think, rightly would have figured in to the possible impeachment charges of Donald Trump, uh, to think about the failure to condemn hate speech. It is a primary role of all public officials, and especially a president. Uh, I've said a lot, some controversial, some not. Uh, a new approach to hate speech from the ones that you've heard of. I should say in Europe, I'm usually uh, criticized for being too weak. I should have a more robust response to hate speech here, being too harsh on hate speech. Uh, but I look forward to your questions and uh, to engaging in the issues of the day. Of course, as one student reminded me today, free speech is all about dialogue. And uh, he was appreciating the dialogue that all of us were having, despite bringing very different ideas to the table. And so I look forward to dialogue with you, to uh, showing that underneath free speech lies an ideal of deliberation. And so let's Let's discuss. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brett Schneider. I, um, I think what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask you some questions because you've stimulated me beyond all belief. Um, <laughs> and then we are going to uh, be taking questions coming in uh, through the Microsoft Teams platform, uh, which are going to show up in a screen in front of me, and I'm going to read them to you, and we'll we'll encounter them together uh, at that point. So that should be that should be interesting. So Thank can you. we can we dig in for a minute? Um, I'm I'm fascinated as a communication scholar by your idea that the government should be an advocate or be expressive and should should communicate. Can you get a little more nuanced about what branches of government you're talking about? Because it seems like we're all getting an education now in the difference between the executive, the attorney general, the Senate, the House, and the Supreme Court. So when you say that government should stand up for itself, do you mean all those branches or is yes. there a difference there? Yeah, great question. And let me first say, you know, usually the Constitution is articulated by the Supreme Court. That's a common view. And so, you know, the court has done its job in Virginia versus Black. If you're a constitutional scholar, you've read those paragraphs and you know that O'Connor said something kind of like what I'm doing, that she mm -hmm. protected the speech uh, of the people on that uh, field, but also condemned it at the same time. But people don't read Supreme Court opinions. And so I think the Constitution and the duty to articulate it the principled obligation, and really there are two arguments in what I'm saying that are, are part of it. One is the duty to prevent the kind of collapse that you saw in Weimar into fascism. The other is a moral duty to explain the principles of the American Constitution and to defend them against its opponents. And the court does that often, regularly, in opinions. But there's got to be a way to promulgate the reasons for our constitutional rights beyond court opinions. And that's a duty that I think is incumbent on every government actor. Uh, because when government acts and free speech now is incorporated, it's incumbent that doctrine that I talked about, not just on the federal government, but on state and local officials as well. And so they also have an obligation at all levels to protect and condemn, whether we're talking about a public university, a town, a state, or uh, the president of the United States. Now, I do think that, you know, in this book that you mentioned, The Oath in the Office, I focus on the role of the president. And uh, you know, I should note uh, that this, we talked about this in one of the sessions, that this has been a failing of the, of the bully pulpit to use it to defend the constitution of both parties and it's been a success of both parties. Woodrow Wilson in showing Birth of a Nation in the White House, uh, being quoted in it, uh, failed in his duty to use the bully pulpit to oppose white supremacy. That's of course Birth of a Nation, a film celebrating rather than condemning the Ku Klux mm -hmm. Klan. But George Bush, when he spoke about Islam and when he was urged by some of his supporters to condemn Islam as a fascistic religion or a hateful religion, said, no, Islam is a religion of peace at some of one of the most tense moments uh, in the country's history after 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is incumbent on all government actors. The president in particular takes an oath to preserve, protect and defend the Constitution. And that means, I argue in the book, to use the bully pulpit to defend the Constitution. And that's why, to me, the, the failure of Donald Trump, even though a failure of a city council person to stick up, uh, to condemn hate speech is a failure, a constitutional duty, uh, a citizen, it's a failure. Uh, when the president fails, it's, it's, we really see it. Uh, it's a, def a, a defiling, really, of the role of that office. Well, and you, uh, you brought up Weimar a couple of times now, and it just makes me think about uh, until recent years, uh, I think a lot of people 
were unaware of how fragile some of these um, traditions and practices are. And so when you look back at the lessons of Weimar and how a society could move from um, an open, progressive, liberal society to a society that is fascist, I mean, what, what do you think... What, what do you think is the weakness? What, what is the weakness or the fragility in there that allows things like that to happen? Do you reflect on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't mean to scare people, but I, you know, our system, I think, in many ways is more fragile than Weimar. Right. Parliamentary right. systems, um, and Weimar is broadly a, was a parliamentary system, um, have an ability to be flexible, to, you know, to move with a uh, crisis and respond to them through no confidence votes, through election of new governments. Right. Uh, but presidential systems are much more brittle, in particular, the president's ability to be in office for four years. The fail safe is supposed to be impeachment. But as we've seen, that is very hard to use, especially when the president has members of his or her own party in one of the houses of Congress. You need two thirds of the Senate to remove. It's much harder than a no confidence vote. So the frightening statistic is that there are two presidential systems that have not collapsed of the many that have had that system. Wow. One is the United States and the other is Costa Rica. And uh, yes, we are vulnerable, maybe more vulnerable than Weimar. My goodness. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, censorship? I, I got myself thinking about it as you were talking about the role of government to protect and condemn and withhold support. Uh, where does censorship uh, fi fi uh, figure in there in terms of uh, speech that can't be protected and and maybe things in the media that that need to be not shown and that sort of thing? I think that um, it's a great question, of course. I mean, early in our history, we had the Alien Sedition Acts in which mm -hmm. um, the Congress passed a law that said basically it was illegal to disparage the president of the United States, criminal. Right. And John Adams used it to prosecute his political opponents. Uh, that kind of censorship we've had, and rightly it's been rebuked. And I think the court's doctrine, which says no viewpoint can be criminalized, uh, is very robust and that it's a good thing because it really protects against uh, the use of somebody trying to imprison a political opponent. It's a very robust protection. As much as I think the Supreme Court has gone in the wrong direction in many areas, I'm thankful for that jurisprudence and I do believe uh, that it would be used to uh, uphold the rights of free speech against the government that tried to um, imprison people for, for speaking out. Now, that said, I think, too, there are ways of improving the discourse, the dialogue of speech without criminalizing. Um, mm. uh, partly it's through these funding mechanisms, but it's also through the use of the public airwaves uh, and uh, bringing back something like the Fairness Doctrine, which would mm -hmm. structure conversation in a way that wouldn't allow it to deteriorate. So uh, I'm thankful that we have a First Amendment protection against criminalization, censorship in that sense, but I think that it's right and not censorship to, to do this. Now, sometimes censorship is that thrown around. Social media companies are very recently doing basically what I'm saying they, they should do. Yeah. They're yeah. allowing a lot of speech and then criticizing it at the same time or labeling it as false or hateful. Uh, and um, that's sometimes called censorship, but I don't think it is. I think it's allowing the speech and then using appropriate counter speech. Yeah, that whole subject is a fascinating one, right, in terms of uh, it's going to take a, year, a number of years for us to sort of reflect back on that and, and, figure, and figure that one out. Um, you know, let me get a little wonky with you since I've got a constitutional lawyer here. Uh, one of the subjects that comes up a lot uh, in the news the last uh, few days, few weeks, during the confirmation hearings is whether the court should be activist or not. And it seems like activism is sort of the epithet that, that people throw at the court when the court tries to uh, influence the way things work. Now, this is, this is your area, so can you talk to us about the relationship between the expressive quality of government and the court and the idea of an activist court? Sure. I should say, you know, activism is an epithet thrown on all sides. And yes. <laughs> it's often used by conservatives to talk about the Warren Court. And, um, you know, even Brown was called an activist decision or many of the criminal rights sure. cases that defended the rights of criminal defendants. And originalism, the view that Amy Coney Barrett has been defending that suggests mm -hmm. that you read the Constitution the way it was originally understood, or originally meant. 
uh, is meant as an anti-activist view, but it couldn't be more activist originalism. Uh, there were no First Amendment individual rights to own a gun that were incompatible with gun regulation uh, until Justice Scalia, really out of the blue in the Heller case, said there were. <laughs> and uh, striking down campaign finance laws is another example of activist originalism. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I really believe it's sort of a, you know, like just one of those words that you say, like, boo. <laughs> right, right. Side. Both sides are doing it. We all, you know, have a vision of the Constitution that requires right. some activism, some pacifism, depending on what's happening in the other branches. And so, uh, so I, w with that said, I guess I don't think my view is that activist. Uh, yeah. it, it requires a robust thing that government has to do, but it's pretty consistent with the jurisprudence. And that was one thing I was trying to show. So Virginia versus Black, I defended that. I gave a spin on it, but I defended it. Uh, mm -hmm. The walk, the the DMV uh, license plate case. Uh, I defended that. B Bob Jones is a canonical case. Now, there are dissents in those cases. There are other visions that people have. The conservatives on the court in Walker thought that it was a free speech violation, that you had to put that flag on the on the license plate. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that's that's wrong. And the court actually so far is really in my tradition. But government has to do more. You've got to use those spaces that the court is open to do what I'm saying in a robust way. John Stuart Mill talked about a culture in which citizens would condemn essentially the wrong views, condemn hate. Uh, but that's not gonna happen naturally, he thought. You need a culture of education that's going to do that. And so a lot of what I'm saying can't be accomplished by courts. It can be accomplished within the contours of it, but, but it's really citizens that have to take action. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, and, and I really get what you're saying. And I think part of the problem is that a lot of, um, nuance has been washed out of the public debate, often on purpose. And your mm -hmm. argument is a pretty nuanced argument. You're saying that, that government has to do two things at once. It both has to protect the system, but also speak on its own behalf. And, and that's a little bit more nuanced. So, well, you, yeah. you talked about censorship and you talked about university speech. And one, one issue I've seen on our campus and on other campuses is a faculty member <clears throat> will sometimes use a racial, racial epithet or a religious epithet as an example of something, quoting something, uh, characterizing something, even belittling something. Uh, and very often the students these days will say, you can't say those things regardless of the context. Is that something mm -hmm. that you've thought at all about in terms of does the context matter or is that just a kind of uh, way of excusing bad behavior? And there are certain words that should never be used in any context. I have thought about it. And, you know, there have been controversies, uh, Brown, other places around exactly those issues. Um, and um, uh, I guess my view is that we have to be careful in how we respond. So the first thing is sometimes when, for instance, um, uh, you know, Catherine McKinnon, for instance, in her work uses the N-word at different points. And so there are controversies where professors will read, read that word and say it. Uh, right. Now, here's my, my view. I think that's not the same as hate speech and it shouldn't be condemned as hate speech. Right. But I do, frankly, having listened to the arguments, hear the, the point that why say the word? Right. That, um, you know, <clears throat> can convey the idea by saying, uh, by abbreviating it. And so, uh, mm -hmm. while I, I'd be weary, certainly, of, of an attempt to punish cert certain a professor who did that or even condemn them, uh, I would say, you know, that's a pedagogical uh, point that, that you want to convey ideas in a way that's not um, off putting to people, that's not threatening to them, that right. doesn't use that. that. So, I guess that's my, my, my bottom line there. I don't think it's really. My framework answers that, but uh, I think kind of decency does. No, I think that's, that's, thank you for that answer. So what about, as long as we're talking about everything that's difficult, what about statues? <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we, had, we had an issue here in Tampa, like most, most southern states, with uh, statues, statues on public ground, statues in front of uh, schools and government buildings and that. Does, you, does your way of thinking about the government sort of enabling versus educating around hateful speech yeah. apply to something like statues? It definitely does. And I talk a little bit about it in the book. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was one of those things that wasn't a live controversy in the way that it is now, right. uh, particular about the Confederate battle flag. And mm -hmm. what I say is, look, you know, the obligation of government 
to speak out has a corollary, which is that certainly it can't use hate speech itself. And I defend the controversial idea there, which is that that really is something that courts can get involved in, that in the same way that they condemn signs that say no, no blacks allowed or no Jews allowed or, or um, say those things in, in even more hateful language uh, as they did, uh, it can also say when government acts, it can't send expression of hate. Now, if that sounds odd to you, I'll just take you to a different area of law. That's standard in the jurisprudence of the Establishment Clause, that government can't erect a cross and a, a sign that says Jesus is Lord on public property. That's not controversial. It can't endorse religion in that explicit a way. It could have a display of multiple religions that conveys an idea of tolerance, but it can't say this religion is true. That's the meaning of the Establishment Clause. And in the same way, I think it can't say uh, you know, equality is wrong. Uh, it can't deny the Equal Protection Clause. Individuals can do it, but government can't do it. And so that's why I think, um, uh, and I have friends, colleagues who I've collaborated with, for instance, on a, uh, in the travel ban, we fought the travel ban uh, in, in multiple levels, uh, arguing that it was unconstitutional animus. We were cited by the dissent, but of course lost the case. But my partners in that are, have been arguing uh, along the lines that I argue in the book, they've been trying to operationalize that into a, into a legal argument in Charlottesville, uh, that it's unconstitutional violation of the Equal Protection Clause to have monuments to, uh, to uh, inequality. And uh, mm -hmm. so some of the Southern mo monuments are not about history. They are put up in the context of opposing equal protection of the law in the 1960s. Right, right, exactly. So just so I'm sure I'm understanding you, so, sure. Uh, the Hillsborough County Courthouse uh, moved uh, Confederate statues to private property far away from there because it didn't want to be associated with the government. Yeah. Um, but uh, about a mile to the east of that, there's a private residence where they have a 100-foot Confederate flag yeah. that flies where everybody can see it. So from your point of view, it's their private property. They're not threatening anybody. Yeah. They can fly that flag, but government okay. should not be. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I and I'd go just a, a, a tiny step further, which is to say not just that that was a good move to move the monument, and yes, it's protected on private property, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it is under the current law, and I defend that. But I actually think government would be banned under the Equal Protection Clause, rightly understood. The courts have not said this. This is my own mm -hmm. view, but that the courts should ban under the Equal Protection Clause uh, the flying of the Confederate battle flag on public property. On public property. Got it. Got it. Do you see um, any possibility in the future that um, the First Amendment will be challenged at all in the United States? Are you concerned at all about uh, free speech and and and, and people trying to make changes to, to the rules of the game in the United States? Yeah, I mean, you know, as you said in the introduction, I, you know, wrote this book. It's a very academic book, but since Donald Trump has been elected, yeah. um, my work has been much more public facing, much more for newspapers and magazines. And, sure. um, you know, one of the things I was speaking out on early on was that the, the Department of Justice under Jeff Sessions, and then my understanding is that continued under Bill Barr, was looking for information about protesters who came to right. protest Donald Trump's and they subpoenaed a company uh, uh, that collected information on a website and the company fought it in the lower courts and my worry is, was that they were gonna stop fighting it and I think that's come to pass. The bottom line is when the President of the United States is really trying to oppose basic values of free speech, as Adams did, we're in real danger. And so, you know, the jurisprudence is one thing, but what the president will do is another. Now, as I said, I'm not, I don't have faith in this court in many ways, but I do think that it's jurisprudence of the First Amendment free speech clause is very robust. So I'd okay. like to see those cases litigated at a more intense level than I've seen them. That case see. in particular. I see. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Bretschneider, we have some uh, audience questions, and so we will encounter them together. So the first question is, where do we draw the line as a society around hate speech? When does hate speech get to be too much and affects others too negatively? And I think maybe what's, what's uh, uh, suggested here is maybe even verging on violence, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, I think the court's jurisprudence has a way of handling it, and I basically agree where the line when it comes to criminalization is. Uh, and that is hateful threats, certainly directed at individuals can be banned. 
um, and imminent uh, speech directed at uh, imminent lawless action or imminent violence is also bannable. Uh, but the problem is, I think, and the, the question gets to this, that courts have sometimes not really been very good at understanding the line. So in the Charlottesville case, and this was a real failing, uh, there was a challenge by the mayor to the march in the center of town. They wanted to move it to a park on the outside of town because they said violence is imminent. We have evidence that there's going to be, this isn't a peaceful march. The Skokie case is a case about the Nazis right. marching in Skokie, Illinois. It was basically no violence. And I think judges had that case in their mind, like, oh, the court says you have to protect it. That's not the law. The law is you stop it when the violence is imminent. And that judge fa obviously failed. And I would say in, in hindsight, it's 2020, but that's not really the case. They had the information at the time. Now we really have it because there's a, there's a woman called R Roberta Kaplan who worked with me on the travel ban case who is bringing a suit on behalf of those who were hurt that day against um, the various... Uh, parties that did the violence saying that it was planned and what they've uncovered are emails showing that this wasn't random violence It was mm -hmm. uh, definitely directed at violence the, the, that it was planned violence So you feel that it would have been within the rights of the government to move that rally that march somewhere else Absolutely. Yeah, the judgment, that, yeah, under the current law as protective as it is and as much of I, as I've emphasized why it's much more protective than the, the rest of the world uh, It doesn't protect that and there are limits, and that judge just didn't do his job. That's the bottom line. Uh, the next question from the audience is uh, something you addressed, I think, earlier, but maybe you just want to put a, a dot, cross the T and dot the I on it. Um, this person is saying, you, you pointed out that the other countries handle anti-democratic views uh, differently, and, and that we saw what happened in Germany. Do you actually see the U.S. US falling into a similar problem since we don't uh, criminalize, I think you called it uh, hateful, hateful speech, right? Yeah, hateful viewpoints. Um, hateful viewpoints I think yeah. it's a danger. I mean, that's that's the pressure. That's the way my argument works. That it's meant to say that the Europeans aren't out of their minds. They're seeing a real problem, which right. is the risk that the hateful society will lead to a collapse of democracy, and they're trying to fend it off through criminalization. The problem is that hasn't always worked for them. Uh, in Greece, in you know, go throughout Europe, you see the rise of hate speech, white supremacy, right. fascism, you know, same or worse than you see it here. So that's in countries where it's criminalized. So, you know, what happened? It hasn't worked because the culture hasn't formed uh, an opposition to it. So that's why I think we have to uh, not go that way, but try to fend off the danger that it certainly could happen here, but to use these other techniques that both protect free expression, but also criticize and, and condemn it and try to transform it. Oh, great, great answer. Yeah, I think it, it's interesting. Um, I, I'm, I'm surprised by how many academics and progressives were so surprised by the amount of hateful speech that came forward over the last couple of years. And I think in some ways sort of unprepared for it, you know, both theoretically and practically and at the dinner table, you know, with family and that sort of thing. Very, very I mean, I'm that symposium, I keep... <laughs> It's like, I'll never forget it. There's that sentence in, in the Brooklyn Law Review, if people want to go find it. One of the critics is a pretty famous scholar of free speech, says this is a non-problem. There is no longer an issue of explicit white supremacy in this country. And yeah. people believe that. And, you know, I didn't believe it, but now you really can't believe it, I think. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, another audience member wants to go back to what we were briefly touched on, which is social media. And you see p social media being used in all different ways to sort of deal with this issue and also promote, you know, on, uh, in every way around this issue. Do you think then that these social media companies should play an activist role in monitoring and, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess monitoring and, and, and making judgments about what's posted? Yeah, I'm more uh, at Jack <laughs> than uh, with Zuckerberg. Uh, you know, he said that he can't, that it's impossible to discern truth from untruth. I think that's absurd. That's you know, absurd. the Holocaust happened. There is climate change. Uh, yeah. QAnon is a nutty conspiracy not based in fact. Right. And the idea that you can't distinguish truth from falsity is, is itself 
unbelievably dangerous. It's a really warping of that neutralist idea that I was talking about. Government, when it's putting people in prison, you know, that's a particular thing that it's doing that comes at a high, high cost. That's the reason why a democracy requires that we don't do that. That's very different than allowing stuff on your platform that is, you know, way outside the bounds of, of reasonable. Uh, but I do also think that there's something to be said for, you know, either that argument that you don't have to give it a platform, or what I'm more sympathetic to is the at Jack uh, uh, argument, the Twitter way of doing it, which is that you allow it, but you label it. I think that's in many ways more effective, that it, it doesn't suppress it, it allows people to see it, but then it also gets the message out that this is hateful or this is false. Yeah, and that's very consistent with your core argument, right? Which is you yeah, want to preserve, yeah. preserve, yeah. preserve the. From them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, this one, oh my goodness, this one looks technical. Dr. Brett Schneider, you have mentioned you see your theory as a third model of First Amendment jurisprudence to save our jurisprudence. This assertion, however, assumes that it needs saving. Why does the First Amendment need saving, in your view? Uh, you know, it's that, that threat that we're all seeing more and more, and we've got to connect mm -hmm. it. We protect all viewpoints, including the extreme fascist viewpoints, uh, the viewpoints of the Klan, the viewpoints of the Nazi party, the viewpoints of those people who are marching in Skokie. As much as I think the judge was wrong to not allow, to allow them to march that closely to the campus in the center of town, they had a right to march. Right. And so if I'm going to defend that, uh, unlike the rest of the world, I've got to find a way to make sure those views don't win. And if you want to know what's wrong if they win, said that's not democracy. That is the collapse of the system. That's that's fascism. And uh, we are facing that as a real threat right now, that hateful society isn't just a dystopia, it's a possibility. And um, uh, you know, I think we've got to come to terms with that by offering mechanisms to combat it uh, within the protections of the First Amendment. You know, we had a speaker not too long ago who wrote a book called Why Believe Science, uh, Naomi Orestes. And mm -hmm. uh, I asked her this question, and I think I want to ask it to you, too. And it's a little bit of inside baseball for one professor to another. Uh, but I, you know, came of age during the whole sort of deconstruction, postmodernist movement in academia, where the whole mission of a lot of academics was to sort of challenge the canonical truths about, you know, what is true and all that sort of thing. Do you think that uh, academics and intellectuals bear any responsibility for this sort of insane level of relativism that we're facing now? Or do you think it has to do with bigger forces than that? Boy, now you're really getting me to call out my colleagues. I definitely do. I mean, I think it's a travesty that that happened. I think it came of a kind of boredom of the time that things were relatively stable and that play was prioritized above all things. It was seen as a sort of fun rebellion. And when you're living in the world that we're living in now, it, it does not, it's not a good look. <laughs> and I have a lot of friends who were part of that and participated in it, some who still do. And I think, wow, if you were disparaging truth, look at who your ally is. Uh, it's the guy in the White House. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, I want to I want to thank you, Dr. Brett Schneider. This has been a fantastic hour, and uh, I've got lots of other questions and things to think about. Thank you for your great work and for your comments today. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise at this critical time in, in our history. And we share your hope that our government will do the right thing, and we will be able to move in a positive direction uh, with all of this. So I want to thank uh, everybody who uh, attended today. I hope that you uh, enjoyed uh, what Dr. Brett Schneider had to say. I hope you found it stimulating. And uh, Dr. Brett Schneider, I hope in the future uh, that you have a chance to come down to Tampa and we can meet face to face and continue these conversations. So thank you very, very much for this evening. Thank you all. What a great day. And thank you to the students for these amazing questions and the honor of, uh, of, of your company. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, everybody.